All right. How many right-handed people do we have in the room? I can tell. <laughs> you go to your right as you come in. Uh, I am right-handed as well, but um, we are definitely uh, staggered to one side this morning. Here's where I want to start. I talked last week, um, kind of the mission of the church and the mission of, of God's people, uh, and, and it is to be a group of people transformed into the way of Christ, working for the good of the lake area and the glory of God. But I want to ask you a question, and I want to ask you, what does this statement do to us? When we read this, what are our first thoughts? This is not rhetorical. Yeah. Anybody else? It does have a lot of need. Yeah. Is this us? If you read this statement or you sh showed it to your neighbor, would they think that it is you? Are you transformed into the way of Christ? And, and I want to guess that our honest answer would be sometimes. Sometimes we, are, we feel like we are transformed into the way of Jesus. And, and there may be some of you who are perfectly content to where God has you, and you are content in your relationship with Jesus and, and your part in the mission. And I want you to know that this message may not be for you, but it may be for someone you know. I think that most of us maybe feel some level of transformation, and, but in reality, we know that there has to be more to this life as a Jesus follower. Am I wrong? So we can't really diagnose it, but it bothers us. We, we sense the brokenness in our world in, in a, a dull kind of way. It means we, we experience it most of the time and we, we sense that something is wrong and something is broken, but we can't diagnose it or always put words to it or even name what it is but we sense this in a dull way as we live our lives. But there are times in our life where we feel it acutely, don't we? We feel and experience the brokenness of this world in a profound, acute, deep way. But that doesn't happen all of the time. Many of you might be in that season now where you just feel the results of a fallen and broken world, but most of us, as we live our lives, sense this just underlying current that something is wrong in this world. And here's what we do. We, we just kind of do our best to accept it and get about our business. We, we say we like, well, I'm going to do my best, right? I'm going to make the best of it. Or, or some of us don't. We whine and complain and uh, live in misery. But for the most part, we try to just say, let's just get about our business and live our lives. And we may even get mad and lash out. This sense of wrong that's in our world, we may just get angry about it on occasions, or some of us walk around angry about it, and, and we may stew in that, and we may lash out. We, and sometimes we even look for someone or something to blame it on. And we sense this brokenness in, a, in this world, and we need to project that somewhere Something is wrong, and I need to put a, a name to it so I can have some sense of relief. And if I say, this is wrong, or that is wrong, or we'll say, like, certain things are wrong, it makes us feel better for a moment, even if it can be in a self-righteous way. So here's what we tend to do. So I, I've been fasting from Facebook this week, and can I tell you, it's been amazing. And maybe everyone is cured for this, and I haven't yet seen it. But here's what we kind of tend to do. We, we will blame it on the Democrats or the Republicans. We'll blame it on taking God out of schools. And we sense that, like, there's something wrong, that, that we've kind of lost something in our country and in our world, and we kind of lash out and we just throw it at the easiest target. We may say the LGBTQ movement. We may say any number of things. 
And Louisiana even took the, the, the next step and they said, hey, you know what? We're tired of this. We're going to put the Ten Commandments in every classroom and every school. And, the, and some of us will cheer and say, yes! Do we stop to ask ourselves the question, is that going to change anything? My gut instinct says no. My gut instinct said that is not going to affect the brokenness of our world. Because we don't, we know rules, don't we? We know rules. Sometimes we even follow rules and we still experience brokenness in this life. So I, I think this effort out of probably good intentions will not change anything. I hope I'm wrong. But that's my gut. So sometimes assigning blame or attacking certain things will make us feel better for a moment. Have you ever done this? You kind of get this like righteous indignation, you think, and you kind of lash out and you say, and I, oh my gosh, I've heard it so many times in this church, like pride month this, pride month that. That's what's wrong with the world. No, that's a symptom of what is wrong with the world. And it's, it, it drives me nuts. But it gives us the ability to name something and assign it to the brokenness in our world. And we feel better for a moment. But we still walk around with this sense of just knowing something is wrong. Does anyone else have this sense? That something is just wrong in our world. And, and here's what we see. Like we see the Bible and we see like things that are positive and tell us who we should be and how we should view things. Like John 10.10, 10, John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We want this, don't we? We want this abundant life. And, and, and for most of us, we feel like we have abundance in moments. But... For the most part, we are not living in the sadness. We are not living in victory of the sadness and the sorrow that rests heavy on our world. So we read John 10, 10, and we know this, and I read it, and I say, man, this is the life that I want, and I know it in my mind, but I don't feel it in my heart. Because I just still walk around and see the, the deep brokenness in our lives. We want this abundant life, don't we? And here's what I want to tell you today. Here's what I want to say. The abundant life you are seeking is on the other side of the surrender that you are avoiding. I want to tell you what this looks like for me. Anyone ever been to lead mine? Out to the Mennonite community. Tunis, some of us call it Tunis or, or Versailles with the Amish or the Mennonite community out there. We've been there. Some of us have been there, right? If you haven't, you should. But do you go out there and it makes you feel like you're missing something? You see the Mennonite community, you go in their stores and everything just feels a little bit different, doesn't it? Does it ever make you feel like you're missing something in your life? Man, you're a lively group. Wow. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the Midwest. Um, but it makes me feel like I'm missing something. Amy and I went there yesterday. Um, we went out to Lead Mine and we went to just the Meadowview Market and we just ordered a sandwich. They're amazing, aren't they? Like two sandwiches and watermelon, and we left there for 11 bucks. 
Hey, it's just, it's awesome. But as we're there, we're watching this, these women just kind of work diligently and people are shopping that aren't Mennonite, but there is just kind of this calm that is in the place that doesn't seem to exist in this. In what looks like an abundant life with big McMansions on the lake and $3 million boats, there is this brokenness that is evident that we don't seem to see in the simplicity of the Mennonite community. And it's there to some extent, but overall, it seems like we're missing something. The brokenness I sense here, I don't sense there. And so we went there, and we sensed that. And, and, and I want to thank my wife for this, because I know what is good for me. I know what the surrender I'm avoiding is, and I still don't do it. So I am bad at Sabbath. I am bad, and I work Sundays. Uh, so I am bad at setting aside a day, and even the days I set aside, do you know what I think about? You. No, it's serious, I, and, and, and it's not healthy. And I, I can say this with complete honesty and transparency, in two years, Six months and 20-something days, I have not taken a full day to not work or think about work. Not one. On, on trips where we're going to funerals or we're doing all these different things, taking the boys and stuff, I have never stepped away from work in my mind. And it has crippled me. Emotionally, spiritually, it has weighed heavy on me. And I have not done that. And I know that the transformation, the life that I am seeking, is on the other side of the surrender I am avoiding. And here, here's what I want you to know happened yesterday. Amy, we do this. We say, hey, what's wrong with our lives? Don't we? And we know. We know why we're unhappy. And we just stay there. But Amy says, hey, you've got to take time off. You've got to stop. This is going to kill you. You are going to die, physically die if you continue. And so we went to Tunis, and kind of the Lord is speaking to me outside of my work capacities. And then we go, we get our sandwiches, we go, and we just sit in the river uh, in Lebanon. We just park our chairs. Amy has a book. I have nothing. <laughs> and I don't sit well. But Amy's reading her book, and I'm sitting there, and the water's cold in the Niangua, but it's refreshing. So we sit, and you know, you put your chairs in, and they kind of sink, and like the water's on your, your backside, and it just feels good and refreshing. And we sat there for too long, first of all, because I am fried. If I showed you my legs, you would feel sorry for me, those of you who like me. Uh, <laughs> But I am fried. Like I have a, a, you don't know if it's a farmer's tan. It, it feels like an idiot's tan at this point. But, uh, but we stayed there for, I don't know, three or four hours. And we just sat in the river. And Amy read her book. And I did absolutely nothing. Can I tell you just how transformative it was? And I knew it's what I needed. But I have avoided it for two and a half years. The transformation that I have been looking for, and this isn't the only area, but is on the other side of the surrender that I am avoiding. And the truth is, I have thought Sabbath was good for you, but not good for me. And we do this with our lives. No Facebook. It, is, it bothered me the first couple of days. Can I tell you how many times I, I, I wanted to like disconnect and just look at Facebook? And how many times I've just reached for my phone, grabbed it, and went look for the app, and it wasn't there? Dozens the first couple of days. And it got better and better and better. And I knew that it was bad for me. It makes me angry. It makes me angry at you guys. It makes you harder to love. 
I'm sorry, but it does. And that may say as much about me as it is, does about you. And it probably does. But I knew that it was bad for me. But God has worked in ways he hasn't because I'm watching cat videos for 15 minutes. Or I'm stewing over your love and adoration for a politician I cannot stand. I, I, this is just being honest. But that was bad for me. I, limit, I, I surrendered that at what, what I believe is obedience. And God is working transformatively in me. And there is still a lot of work to do in me. But I want you to know that the abundant life you're seeking is on the other side of the surrender you are avoiding. And for some of you, that is not Facebook. It's not the things you eat. It, 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 it may be, if you're a mom here, it may be the incessant need to run your kids around and make them happy. And it is robbing you of any joy in this life. And you know that, and you keep doing it. For some of us, it is, some of you, it's the six days of Sabbath that you have a week. It's chasing the constant pleasure and feeling you get, those momentary, momentary feelings of doing stuff and buying stuff and going places and visiting people. And it, you know in your mind that if you just scaled your life down, you would feel so much better. And you still won't surrender it. But I earnestly believe that the abundant life you're seeking is on the other side of the surrender you are avoiding. And I want to ask you the question. Do you feel like your life is missing something? If you don't, this isn't for you. But if you do, I want to offer you something different. I want to show you life in the kingdom. And we think in our minds about life in the kingdom is when we get to heaven. But here's what I want to tell you. Life in the kingdom is now. We can begin to experience the kingdom, the economy of God, the life of God here on earth through surrender to Jesus Christ and his ways. But here's what has to happen in your mind. You have to surrender and say, you know what? I am going to try the ways of Jesus even though it doesn't make sense to me. Because I'm tired of this constant hamster wheel of never feeling enough or never feel like I'm doing enough or never feeling like I've experienced enough pleasure and believe him when he says the kingdom is so much better. Like we all know, like the narrative of the Gospels teaches us like to not pursue treasure on this earth. That we would be happier if we had a more simple life. How many of us are winning at that? Yes. You are. But am I right? So we, we know this. And we know Jesus is good enough that this can be true, but we still don't surrender. Because that seems counterintuitive to the world around us and the way we are conditioned to live. And it is. And when we see the first century church and the impact on the world and how the church lived and how the kingdom expanded in the first three centuries. And we see that like they sold their possessions and they gave to the poor and they lived this life that they learned from the gospel of Jesus and they exploded. 
And somehow we say, well, ah, that just, that's not for us. This is a different world. This is a different time. I'm going to invite you today to surrender the old way of life and make a step forward into the kingdom by obedience. So we're doing this in a sermon series called Bless. We're talking about the bless rhythms that we can live our lives on mission and be formed in the way of Jesus. If you haven't been here before, hear Bless. These are daily rhythms that I believe will form you in the way of Jesus. Begin with prayer. I, I, I want to just talk about this for a second. But So begin with prayer. This is a centering relationship with Christ. I, I want you to cast your needs and your cares upon Jesus. But here's what I really want you to understand. Beginning with prayer is saying, God, change me. I'm tired of this. I don't want to exist for myself or the, the whatever has got my heart at the moment. And it's saying, God, change me through the work of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what beginning with prayer looks like. And then it's listen and engage. So as we're going and we're living our lives on mission, we're following the example of Jesus and we're listening for his voice. But we're also listening to the people we come in contact with. And that means asking good questions before you, because you care. It means earning the influence to engage the brokenness in their lives. Eat. That was predictable. Um, eat. We all eat, right? Some of us eat more, some of us eat less, but we all eat. It is a rhythm that we have in our lives. And, and what I'm saying is be like Jesus and eat with people. Begin with prayer. Change me, Lord. Listen and engage. And then maybe say, hey, why don't you come to my house for dinner? Let me cook you a meal. Not let me explain to you the Romans road or the four spiritual laws, but let me cook you a meal. Let us look eyeball to eyeball over something everyone has to do. Rich, poor, male, female, all of that. Let me eat with you. The fourth one is serve. That's where we are this week. We're going to talk about serving. Everyone likes to serve, right? Yeah, we all like to serve. This is a hard one. Because we don't really know what it means to serve in a Jesus kind of way. We know what it means to serve, like volunteer for children's ministry, which no one wants to do. Yeah. Or or help out with the coffee bar or mow the grass or we which also no one wants to do. Like serving in that way, like me asking you to to transactionally come and serve here at the church, which I think is important. But serving like Jesus is to begin with prayer, listen and engage, eat with people, when brokenness is exposed to you, it's serving people. It's giving away your life for something more than you are. Serving. Here's why I want to talk about serving. The first thing is, information alone doesn't transform anyone. Has anyone... <laughs> Has anyone ever researched information on getting healthy? Have you ever even learned maybe a lot of information? How's that working for you?
Information alone does not transform anything. Information is not bad, but it doesn't change anything. If I read Dave Ramsey's book on personal finance and I do nothing that he told me to do, how's that going to work for me? Information does not change anyone. And I love information too much, actually. But it doesn't transform anyone. Whew. How many of us have sat in Bible studies for 40 years? For 10 years? And we are not transformed. How many of us have done Bible quizzing? And you know every verse, and you got them memorized, and you've you got the information, but you're living your life for yourself and not for Jesus. Information does not transform us alone. I have read a lot of books. I have read books on being organized. I think there's, there's, so there's probably two women in this church that could attest to that more than anyone else. It's Amy Holt and Anna Leeser. Uh, I have the information. It has not transformed me. Amen? Information alone does not transform us. Second thing I want to talk about in serving Everyone serves in the family. Everyone serves in the family. In your family, does one person do everything? Some families they do. She's called mom. But in a well-functioning family, everyone serves. Your teenage boys see the trash can is full and they grab the trash and they take it out. In the family, everyone serves. And, and so this is our fault. And I say our leaders in the church, like we've kind of created an atmosphere where you go to church and you sit and you face me, right? Like you're centered around the stage. Everything we've done has set up a place to, for, to give you information for you to consume. The entire setup is built around that. It is not your fault. But here's what happens. People come and they leave because they never feel like they're part of the family. So this week at dinner church, which I love, um, I was watching, and so Amy and Andrew and, and Marie did the cooking and, and a lot of the other stuff, but there is kind of this atmosphere where everyone serves, and it feels like family. Everyone picks up when we're done. Maybe not the first or second week, but very quickly, like, there is an atmosphere where everyone serves because we're all part of the body of Christ. It's not organized around you coming once a week, paying your tithes, sitting there and listening to me preach and kind of hoping for the best the rest of the week. And I saw two guys come closer to the family this week, and they are guys that are not part of us on Sunday mornings. But they, they've been coming. They've been kind of consuming the meal, and I've watched people eat with them, listen and engage them, talk to them. And this week, I sat and I watched them one guy's taking off tablecloths, bringing them up, bringing them over to be washed. Another guy's picking up trash bags. And we didn't ask them to do this, but they're starting to feel like family. And everyone in the family serves. So are, if you are feeling disconnected from the body of Christ here at New Life Church, I'm going to ask you to serve someone. Because in the family of Christ, everyone serves. And sometimes you serve out of your gifting. 
your spiritual gifting, but sometimes you just take the trash out. Sometimes you just do what needs to be done. And here's what happens. You start to get a vested interest in the transformation of the people in this building. And I know, like, everyone's busy, and this is not a lecture about, like, I need help. That's not all it is. Um, (laughs) But, like, if you're part of the family... You serve because this is not something that we consume. And I know you pay me to do this every week, and I'm grateful for that. But this is not something we consume. This is who we are. The church is not New Life Church building at 135 Bear Paw Road. We are just the people of God who gather in this building. It's not a temple, it's not sacred, it's a building that we gather in, and that makes it sacred because we are the body of Christ. But to be in the spiritual family of believers, the body of Christ, you're going to have to serve at some point. And I said it last week, but Matt Chandler is better than me, and you can find him on YouTube. Francis Chan is better than me, and you can find him on YouTube. But when you start to serve you'll be amazed at how much more you care. Last thing. Serving demonstrates the upside-down kingdom of God. That's a lot. So in this world, how are things organized? You have kings and presidents, and congressmen, and women, and you have CEOs, and CFOs, and and upper management, and middle-level management, and then you may have a supervisor, and then you have worker bees, and there's this kind of hierarchy of how Babylon operates, right? If we view the church like that, you see there's Jason, like the board, and then everyone else, this kind of what we would view that through a Babylonian system. But serving in the kingdom demonstrates the upside-down kingdom of God. And I want to take us to Mark 10, 35 to 45. I'll give you a second to get there. I'm in the NIV. Mark 10, 35 to 45. It will not be on the stage. Verse 35, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's lofty. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? They replied, let one of us sit at your right and and the other on your left in your glory. Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten others, there's twelve of these guys, so let's just imagine this, there's There's 12 of these guys, and James and John say to Jesus, Hey, first of all, we want you to do whatever we ask, Lord. Um, And then we want to sit at your right hand and your left hand. And and these other 10 guys do this. They said, When they heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. That seems very human, right? I mean, that seems like the way we would act. Like, oh, he just wants to be the teacher's pet. They became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high, high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you 
must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And we've read books on, Colin Powell had a book on servant leadership. We talk about serving and being servant leaders. But Jesus demonstrates the upside down nature of the kingdom of God. And that meaning, if you're thinking of a pyramid, Jesus is on the bottom. And your goal better to be right above him. Because that demonstrates that there is no Jew or Gentile. That there is no rich or poor or male or female. That these don't exist in the kingdom. There is no preference based on circumstances, skin color, or gender. There is only our standing in Christ. This is an upside down kingdom. So to lead, you must serve. To get, have influence, you must serve. This is the nature of Jesus in this kingdom. And this is counterintuitive to the world. But it is the most attractive thing you will ever experience. You may think about a boss in your life that has just blown you away. And it may blow you away, he or she initially because of their intellect or their, their wit or their charisma, but they will blow you away in the long term because of the way they serve and the way they care. That is the nature of the upside down kingdom where we take a lowly place intentionally for the glory of God and the good of our neighbors. This is counterintuitive. This is not what we are conditioned to be in this world. But when you serve people, they feel loved. When you serve people that you cannot get anything back from, the kingdom of God is proclaimed. And, and so what does this look like? Because I can say these, and these are lofty words and grand aspirations, and this is the way of Jesus. But here's what it might look like. And, I, and I've kind of been thinking about this this week. And so I went to the gas station this week to get gas. Uh, and here, here's what I noticed. I noticed a black family. This is something that you notice at the lake. We are 0.65% African American in Camden County. But that means there are 468 black people in Camden County. And my heart just said, and this is the Lord gave me this. He's like, hey, I wonder if there's a place where they felt, where they feel heard or saw. I wonder if there's a place they don't feel uncomfortable in as the only black person there. I wonder what it must feel like to be a minority in Camden County. And then we think about our, our, our Mexican restaurants, El Cap or El Patron or whatever your favorite is, and they're mainly staffed by Hispanic folks. And so Hispanic folks make up about 2% of people at the Lake of the Ozarks. Do you know how many Hispanic churches there are? Zero. So say, is there a place, many of them are Catholic, but say, is there a place that they feel heard, seen, and they don't feel different? So as I'm beginning to pray, I'm beginning to pray in this, I say, Lord, change my heart. Like, give me a burden for these people in this community. Give me a burden to see them like you see them with the mercy and the grace that you see them with as your children and image bearers. Don't, take, don't let me take my status and things that I have for granted, but give me a burden. So my prayer is that God gives me the opportunity to listen to their story and engage in their lives this year. 
And I'm not saying that has to be yours or that's the only way this plays out, but I'm saying that is my prayer that I can somehow hear the voice, hear their story, know who they are and engage in the the brokenness of their lives. And that I might be able to eat a meal with someone who looks very different and experiences life very differently than I do here at Lake of the Ozarks. Because I want to be transformed into the way of Christ, working for the good of the lake area and the glory of God. And I believe that he has a burden for people that are poor and marginalized in our society. And we may look, and I'm not asking you to have my burden, but we may look and say like, hey, well, like Hispanic people, black people have every opportunity we do here. So that is partially true, but it still feels different to be the only of anything in every space you go to. So that's a burden that the Lord is giving me and and birthing in my heart. So I want to pray that God changes me. I want to listen and engage. I want to eat with them and I want to serve them. I have not done it. But I'm praying that the Lord gives me those opportunities in my life because I think it makes a difference if I serve a group of people or a person that I can get nothing from materially, financially, or physically. But here's what I also know. I will get a ton from that. He may give me an opportunity to change their life, but he will absolutely change my heart. So the upside down kingdom is divesting yourself of the power that you may or may not have earned. Because we don't live in Babylon. We live as kingdom citizens. So power is not something we value. Meekness and humility are. So it means intentionally divesting yourself from your affluence and your power. I'm not saying give it all away. It's not what I'm saying but intentionally setting that aside to serve someone in the way of Jesus. We've all heard, maybe we haven't heard the saying, but the foot of the cross is level, right? The ground at the cross is level. We all stand the same way. This demonstrates that. What may it look like for you? Here's what it, practically plays out like you pray God give me a burden change my heart give me a love for people give me a love for a group of people that need my love and need your love God and then you begin to pray for those people and then you begin to pray that you might be an answer to those prayers that you might be the answer to the very prayers that you are praying. Serving demonstrates the upside down nature of the kingdom. And I'm closing. I want you to serve. I want you to serve in the church. I think you're going to grow more from serving than you are a small group. I don't think you, I think you can grow in a small group. I think you're going to grow more into the way of Jesus by serving than you will a small group. But what I'm really asking you today, what is it that you need to surrender in your life? Because I believe that your transformation you're looking for is on the other side of your surrender. And for some of us, we just need to surrender our lives. We are walking and talking and living for ourselves and it is wearing you out.
and thoughts come into your mind and say, if I can buy this or do this or make more friends or do this or do that, then I will be happy. Then I will have the abundant life that Jesus promises us. But I believe that that abundant life is on the other side of your obedience. So we're going to pray. And if you've believed in Jesus for a long time and you've never surrendered your life, I believe today is that moment for you. We're going to open the altars and we're going to, to pray for you if you're willing to make that step. Do not feel pressured. You can make that step in your seat. But what is it in your life that's keeping you from transformation? Heavenly Father, we want to serve, Lord, but we really, we just want to experience the abundance that only you can give. We want to experience the peace that passes all understanding. God, maybe that means we just can't understand it. So Lord, I'm praying for every, every person here, Lord, every soul, every image bearer that you love deeply, God. God, would you show them what it is that, that you're calling them to surrender? Would you do a work that only you can do? Would you begin to form us in the way of Jesus and into this transformed life that you designed for us, God? Will you lead us on a path to victory? Would you sanctify us, Lord? Would you give us a heart to be set apart and holy? God, and I pray for those who are fighting surrender this morning, Lord. Would you work would you work in their hearts? God, I pray for those who have never surrendered their lives. They believed in their heart, but never surrendered to you as Lord. Would you prompt, that to do the, prompt them to do that this morning? God, every man, woman, child in this room, we're praying that you use them for your glory and the good of this community. We pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing one final song. We're going to take communion as a, a church family. I want to remind you the altars are open if you want to pray. Um, the communion stewards are going to come forth. We're going to take communion as a, a family when you are ready. What a great day. Hey, we appreciate you supporting the ministry of New Life Church financially. There's two ways to give, newlifeatthelake.com. There's an offering box in the back. Uh, let me bless you and send you on your way. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you and would his face ever shine upon you. In the name of Jesus, go in peace.